country. Y'all like country? All right, well, good morning. I just want you to see you are in for a treat. We have a whole page worth of announcements this morning. Uh, oh, great. We're not done yet. Well, it's good to have everybody here with us today. Uh, glad you could join us on this, this warm, bright, sunny day. Uh, just a few things before we jump into worship uh, to let you know about. Uh, first thing, uh, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who came out yesterday and helped us out at the woods. Uh, if you don't know who we are, you'll notice the ones that are walking around going, and our arms are heavy, and uh, we got to spread uh, a lot of new mulch and dug out some old mulch and trimmed up a bunch of hedges and all kinds of good stuff but uh, thank you for coming out uh, it, this isn't the last time that we will head out there there's a whole list of things that we are hoping to accomplish out there uh, but we did get to see Miss Francis yesterday she said to tell everybody hello um, and I told her that uh, you know we'd save her a seat because she said she wants to get back here soon uh, so anyway, but uh, thank you for everybody who helped yesterday. Uh, tonight, uh, we will be having Sunday night uh, Bible study to be here at the church at 5 o'clock. And so people have asked me, where are we going to be? Well, that really depends on you. Um, if we have this group show up, we'll be in here. If we don't, then we will probably be down in the classroom. But anyway, tonight at 5 o'clock, be here for a time of Bible study as we enjoy that together. And there will be a place for children outside while we do Bible study. No, I'm joking. Uh, the next thing for us is um, immediately following church this morning is our regular monthly business meeting. Uh, we don't have just a ton of stuff that's come up, but uh, if you would like to 
to hear where we're at and what's going on. Uh, you can stick around for that this morning. Uh, like I said, we'll have a, just a short break uh, as soon as we get done, and then we'll meet back in here and uh, knock out our monthly business meeting. Uh, senior adult luncheon is a week from this Thursday, so September 28th. Um, is going to be the, the lunch, and it'll be here at noon. So uh, if you are available that day and would like to come, it's a potluck. So just, just bring your favorite dish, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, the only other thing that I have, or actually they go in conjunction with one another, uh, our one-day mission project that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks now um, is fast approaching. We are less than a month away from one day, and on that day, there are going to be Baptists from all over the state descend on Monticello as we tackle these uh, different mission projects. Uh, they told us in our meeting the other night there are over 130 different mission sites that will take place here in Southeast Arkansas on that one day, and so uh, be praying that you know God is already going out ahead of us and the people that we're going to meet that hearts are open and that uh, as the gospel is presented, they respond. Uh, it is not too late for you to sign up for one day. Um, that deadline is going to be September 21st, I believe, uh, where you have to have your registration in by then. But it's not too late. But uh, if you're not going to come or if you are coming and you still just want to help in other ways, uh, we got two things that we're collecting right now. Uh, one, you saw the big box of coats that is fast filling up out there. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to have a coat drive, and that will be in conjunction with our food distribution site here. Um, and so we're going to do those. But also, as part of the food drive, uh, we need to collect some canned goods. So there's some boxes scattered throughout the building there. Um, if you have something or you're going to make a trip to the store and you can help in that way, pick up a couple of things, drop it in the box, and it's, uh, it helps us be able to give out more stuff on that day when people come to us. Uh, but that's what we got going on there. Um, the last thing is for the month of September, we have been collecting our Dixie Jackson State Missions offering. Uh, the reason that ties into one day is 60% uh, of the one day budget comes directly from this Dixie Jackson mission offering that is taken up all over the state. Uh, every dollar that we take up in the plate here and in churches like ours all over Arkansas stays right here in Arkansas to do missions and ministry right here in Arkansas. And so as we take this up, um, our, our goal is $1,000, but you give as the Lord leads you to partner in this ministry. But uh, we're going to watch a, a quick video uh, to give you another glimpse of what the Dixie Jackson offering helps to fund, and then we're going to go into worship. But my wife's waving at me first. Well, that's not quite the Jane Meeks playbook, because if you remember Miss Jane in the 24 hours of prayer, there were sometimes she'd just tell you, I put you down for whatever time. But uh, we do have a children's church sign-up list going around, so if you would be willing to take a Sunday or two, uh, let us know and we'll put you down on that. All right, well, uh, let's watch our video and then we'll jump into worship.
Prayer for worship. <clears throat>
from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead was from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe of the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church with Christ was born, and the Spirit. Shout out fame by his blood and in his name, hidden. 
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for letting us be here this morning. God, and I thank you that uh, we've had a chance, Lord, to lift our voices up to you. And God, I just pray that right now as we get ready to, to open your word, that God, you would just speak directly to our hearts. Lord, for those of us who need the challenge this morning, Lord, I pray that you'd challenge us. Lord, for those of us who need to be encouraged through your word, I pray that you would encourage us. But God, whatever it is we need, we pray that we would find it in your word this morning. So God, just have your will and your way in each and every one of us. Lord, we love you, and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, all right, well, if you've got a Bible with you, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today. Well, I don't know about you, uh, I look around the room and I don't think it's uh, unusual. Most people in here would say, I have a cell phone. And most of you would say, I somewhat, usually, mostly know how to use that cell phone. And then some of you, if you got really brave, you go, I'm still on the flip phone. This is not going to pertain to me at all. But no, most of you, you have what they call a smartphone, which means that you've got to be somewhat smart to be able to operate it. But one of the things that you have at your fingertips on a smartphone is you really have the world at your fingertips. You can do whatever you want to do. You can find whatever you want to find. And it has changed the way that we do life. There was a time when to get news, you had to go down and you had to either, you know, put money in the little machine to get the paper out. Or if you were in the habit, they would deliver it to your door. Or some of you remember a time when you could actually pay somebody to give you the newspaper. Um, but there was a time when you had to do something like that to get the printed news. But now then, we have the cell phone, and we live in the day and age where it is literally right there at your fingertips. You can look up any story that you want, read any article that you want, and that's one of the things that I do on my cell phone, is I'll flip through there and I'll just see what the, the current events are, you know, what, what's going on in the world today, and some of it I don't read much of because it just aggravates me and makes me mad. I'm like, I don't need another reason for my blood pressure to go up, so we'll just scan on past that one. But as I was flipping through the news stories the other day, I came across an article, and it was talking about the, the great exodus of people from the American church over the last two decades. And the article is written and is based off a book written by two men, two pastors, uh, Jim Davis and Michael Graham. And this was the title of the book that they wrote, The Great Dechurching. Who's leaving? Why are they going? And what will it take to get them back? Well, as a pastor, I'm telling you, the, the title kind of caught my attention. And so this wasn't one of those articles that I was just going to skim by. It may have made my blood pressure go up when I read, read it, but I was going to read this article. And I'm glad I did because in this article, here was one of the quotes from the book. It says, more people have left the church in the last 25 years than all the new people who became Christians from the First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, and the Billy Graham Crusades combined. Now let that sink in. We think about great movements of God, and we hear things like the First Great Awakening, and where there's just this massive worldwide revival. We think of things like the Second Great Awakening, which happened a few decades later, and again, this massive worldwide revival. And we live in a day and age now where Billy Graham is not uncommon to church people. We, we understand who he was and understand what he did. And we remember the thousands upon thousands who responded to his simple gospel message to come to Christ. And when I 
read this quote, it just smacked me upside the head. More people have left the church in the last 25 years than came to the church through the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, and the Billy Graham Crusades combined. Now, folks, that's a lot of people. That is a lot of people who've left the church. Well, the article went on and it said, well, why did they leave? And so they, they'd surveyed these people and they'd broken them up into groups and we don't have time to go into all their data and statistics. But here are some of the reasons that were given most often for people walking away from church, for leaving the church. Some people said they were hurt by somebody inside the congregation. I'm just going to be honest with you. If you have been a believer for very long, if you've been inside of a congregation for very long, guess what? There's a good chance that you have been hurt by somebody inside a congregation. Well, most of the people, or I say most, a good number of the people that were surveyed said that was one of the reasons why they had stepped away from churches. They'd been hurt by somebody inside the congregation. Others gave the reason that they found the attendance had become inconvenient to their lifestyle. Uh, we've talked about this before. It was when you start making priorities, over the last 25, 30 years, what we see is churches started to slip on the priority list. Uh, other things have become more important. You know, and people said it, it just became inconvenient. It didn't really fit my lifestyle anymore. Uh, some people went on and said they quit coming, they checked out because they no longer agreed with a doctrinal stance that the congregation had taken. And we've seen this played out not just, you know, in places like California or wherever. We see that happening right here in Arkansas where people go, I don't believe that way. I don't agree with that. And so they, they, they walk away. And, but that was one of the reasons given. Now, another one, and this one was just much more blunt, more people than I care to admit in the study said, they walked away. They were no longer involved because they just simply no longer saw a benefit in attending. Now, we could go on and on about the benefits, but it also displays an attitude that we see pretty prevalent. This consumer attitude of what can I get out of it? And when they no longer saw that they were getting anything or that there was something that they could take home, they said, I'm going to walk away. Most of the time when I read these articles on my phone, it's easy for me to just to, to go on past them and go on about my day. This one lingered. This one stuck with me. And it just gnawed at me. And partly because I am a pastor and partly because I, I know I've seen people out of my own congregations walk away for whatever reason, never to be seen again. And it just gnawed at me. And I kept thinking... I see the reasons why you say you left. But what can we take from this? As I read the article, and I reread the article, and I thought about the article, it hit me that the reason that so many people have left church is because they have a fundamentally flawed idea of what the church ought to be. They have a wrong idea, a flawed idea of what the church ought to be. And so, over the next few weeks, we're going to try and answer that question. What is church? And if we can answer the question of what church is, then my prayer is that hopefully we'll be able to understand what our place is in it. But before we do that, I want to tell you some things that church is not. Okay? Church is not a place that we go to. It's not a destination um, that we, you know, put in our, our maps and we drive to or whatever. Church is not a place that we go. Church is also not an event that we attend. As if we're just scheduling it like we do a concert or a ball game. or whatever. Church is not an event that we attend. Church is also not a social club that we belong to. Where if you're here, you get all the rights and privileges and you get to... That church is not a social club. But I bet if you went and you asked the people who were surveyed for the article, for the book, many of them would have thought this, 
one of those, if not all three of those, applied to what church is. But it's not. So like I said, for the next few weeks, we're going to seek to answer, what is church? And we're going to go to the only place that I know to go to, Scripture. What does Scripture teach us about the church, Big C? What does he tell us about the church? And what's my place in it? Well, we're going to have a working definition that we're going to work off over the next few weeks. And this is what it is. What is church? church? The church is a body of believers set apart and ordained by God to impact the world by bearing witness to his love and the truth of his word. Let's look at it again. A, the church is a body of believers set apart and ordained by God to impact the world by bearing witness to the depth of his love and the truth of his word. Well, that's not really that great or profound of a definition, is it? There's nothing there that you go, oh, that's new information to me. We understand this. We, we, we realize this, and we will say that we acknowledge it and believe this. Well, if we believe that the church is all of those things that we just said, then it ought to impact us and tell us what our place is in it. So this morning, we're going to look at the first part of that definition, it says the church is what? A body of believers. Now we're going to, over the weeks, kind of dissect this definition and take it little by little. But this morning we're going to start by looking at that very first part. The church is a body of believers. So folks, I want you to hear me for a second. The church is made up of a group of born-again believers in other words, to be born again, what must happen? There has got to come a point in time where you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ if you want to be a part of the church. The church is a group of believers that has yielded to the lordship of Jesus and unapologetically lifts him up as our savior and our redeemer. Now many of you know people have been part of a church role, had their name on the church role, you know, granddad was a deacon or a former pastor or whatever. They've been to church their whole lives. But here's the thing. If you cannot, in good conscience, honestly look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm a born-again believer. I've submitted myself to the Lordship of Christ, and I unapologetically claim him as my Savior and my Redeemer. Guess what? You are not part of the church. The church that God has set apart and ordained to change the world. If you can't say that, you're not part of this body of believers. But sadly, we've seen that a lot, haven't we? Throughout the ages, many people have deceived themselves due to religious involvement. Oh, they had their seat. They had their pew. They could do all the right things. They were comfortable around religious people. They could speak the language. They could even keep up the routine. But they could not look themselves in the mirror and say, yes, that's me. And as good of a church member as they might have been, they weren't part of the church. In the book of Acts, we get a pretty detailed picture of what the church, this first body of believers look like. It was an interconnected group that came from all different kinds of backgrounds and experiences. And when that group came together and formed one body, what's the book of Acts tell us happened? The world was changed. We start the book of Acts and they are a struggling small group that can't leave the room because they are so afraid of what waits on them outside. And by the time the book of Acts ends, it has spread all over the known world. People are giving their lives for what they believe. When that group came together and formed a one single body, it changed the world. As we look at their story, 
if we look at Scripture to see their story, we can find the answers for us so that we can carry on what they started. So what does Scripture tell us about this group, this body of believers? Well, we're going to see it here in Acts chapter 2. We're just going to pick up here in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That's a pretty well-known passage of Scripture. We've looked at it before. But as we see this, we see that God has, from the very beginning, had a very specific plan for this body of believers. Now, by the time we get to Acts chapter 2, Jesus has already uh, told the disciples they were going to be his witnesses around the world. They've watched him ascend into heaven and disappear into the clouds. They have went back and hide, hidden themselves in that upper room. But remember what happened while they were in that upper room? Pentecost happened. I know, we're good Baptists, and people go, oh, I don't know, even, even just the term Pentecost just kind of makes me a little leery. I don't know, I mean, should we be talking about that here in the Baptist church? Yes, absolutely we should. Because there ain't nothing wrong with the Holy Spirit moving. In fact, something's wrong when it doesn't. But as they gathered together there in that upper room, and the Holy Spirit, the promised one, fell upon them, you know this had to be a freaky sight. So as they look, it says something like tongues of fire were dancing over their heads. I'm wondering what I ate the night before if I see that, because I'm going, this is not normal. But it wasn't just that they saw these tongues of fire. What happened? All of them started speaking a language they had not learned. Now, folks, I've taken French. I've taken Spanish, I've taken Greek, I've taken Hebrew. You want to know what I can speak somewhat well? English. <laughs> Those other ones, I can pick out a word every now and then. But it says, here is this group of people, all of them speaking a language they had not learned. And it wasn't just that they were speaking a language that they had not learned. They were testifying about Jesus in the language that they had not learned. Well, you can imagine this causes quite the stir. And a crowd forms around the house where they are, and they think that they're drunk. And I'm like, I ain't never seen a drunk person speak intelligibly like that. But there they were, and what happens? Peter stands up. And Peter, the one who's always famous for putting his foot in his mouth, Peter gets it right. And Peter stands up, and he addresses the crowd that is gathered. And starting from the beginning of Scripture all the way to Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven, he testifies about God's plan. And as people hear this in their own languages, the miraculous happens. It says around 3,000 people accepted the message that day. Around 3,000 people became a born-again believer that day. They said, yes. Jesus is my Lord. Yes, Jesus is my Savior, my Redeemer. He is the source of my hope and my faith and my trust. And the church changed. They went from this small, huddled, fearful group to literally, over the course of one sermon, grew into this multitude of people. Now what? What was God going to do through them? What was the plan? Well, we see that God had an unmistakable plan even from the very beginning. And it was going to be in this devotion that they made, that they had to Him and to each other that was going to set the church apart. And as we look at the, the very first part of this passage that we read in verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. There's four things what we're going to look at this morning. These devotions that, that this early church had, again, to God and to each other, and because of that, the world was changed. And I'm just going to let you know up front, that's my prayer. Is that we, as a body of believers, say we're going to devote ourselves to these same things. And we're praying that as we do, that God, you will do the same thing through us that you did through them. You will change the world. So what was that recipe? Well, it tells us that they were devoted to learning together. In our passage, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And there's a couple of things I want you to take out of this. I mean, it's a very short phrase here. But there's a couple of things that we can glean from this. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Where were the apostles? They were gathered together in one place. They haven't been scattered yet. They weren't all out doing their own thing. They weren't making house calls. They were there together. So if this body of believers was going to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, what had to happen? They had to come make a commitment to worship together. Now, folks, I know the last few years have been really crazy in our world. Uh, things that we've never seen before, and honestly, I'm praying we never see again. Unprecedented things where you go, what happened and how did we get here? And it seemed like it happened just like that, didn't it? I remember when COVID hit, we had regular Sunday morning services, had regular Sunday night services. That Monday night, I had a pastor's meeting. And they talked about how it was on the horizon, things were coming. And folks, literally by the next Sunday, we had called off church. That quick. Now, little did we know at that time what COVID was going to unfold to be or how bad it was going to be happen as a result of it. All we knew is that we were going to try and make the best of a, out of a bad situation. But we can look around and we see that there's still many that we don't see. That we did. Once upon a time we did. But they've walked away from church for whatever reason. Now folks, I want you to understand me. I am beyond grateful that we have resources available to us that can help us to stay connected when life gets in the way. Because there's things that happen, that aren't there? We can have a death of a loved one. We can have, you know, something, you know, Dad, God, I woke up this morning, my house was flooded, the, the hot water tank had busted, and we're just having to deal with it. I get that. And I'm beyond grateful that we have ways that we can stay connected like that in the short term. But we can never forget what Scripture tells us. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, what does it tell us? Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Is it just so that we can say that we were here, we can mark our attendance records and pat ourselves on the back because we filled our pew that day? No, that is not the pattern we see in Scripture at all. The reason that Paul urged them to be together, the reason that we see here uh, the pattern set by God from the very beginning is that they engage in corporate worship is because there is something that happens when we're here together as a body of believers. We've got things where we can stay connected to each other in the short term. But it's not a recipe for long-term success. There's something that happens when we're gathered together. Now hear me. There ain't nothing about this building that makes that magical. It's the people gather together that makes it what God designed it to be. And when we look at this and we see that they were devoted to learning together, that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, what we see is that they made a commitment to come together for worship corporately. I understand that we worship individually as well. And I hope you do. I hope you spend time in the Word by yourself. I hope you spend time worshiping on your own there's just something special that happens when we share that with each other. And it was part of God's design from the very beginning here. 
So when we see that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that was part of how they were devoted to learning together. But here's the second part of that. What were they learning from the apostles? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So as the apostles expounded on Scripture, as the apostles shared their testimonies, their witness of who Jesus was and all that he had taught them, this is what they poured out into the congregation that had gathered there with them. And the circle just kept on going. You see, it wasn't just that they gathered together. They made learning the truth a priority. See, sadly today, we have places all over. They'll gather together. They'll draw a crowd. They're good at being around each other. But I don't know that we would call it the apostles' teaching. You might get some feel-good motivational speech. You might get a shot in the arm that tells you you're good enough just the way you are and don't let anybody tell you differently. But you won't get a lick of scripture. That wasn't God's model. The model was to gather themselves together and to dig into the truth of God's word and what he was going to teach you through it. And folks, if we want to be what the church is designed to be, we ought to follow the same model. It's not just that we're gathering together together as a body, but we're digging into the truth together and letting it speak to us individually and corporately. Scripture is the basis for all that we do. And if there ever comes a time when it is not, we're in trouble. Because we have ceased to be the church that Christ designed. We see here that these early believers, this early body believers of the church, they devoted themselves to learning together. But we go on, and what else do we see? We see that they devoted themselves to doing life together. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to what? Fellowship. Now, the Greek for that is koinonia. And koinonia, people can say, oh, it's friendship, it's, you know, togetherness. It is so much deeper than that. Koinonia means this close, active, thriving relationship where you are involved in something together. You are locked arms, shoulder to shoulder, going through this. And when we see that, that's what this group of believers was devoted to. This kind of fellowship, this kind of doing life together. Now here's the thing. We just talked about how they were devoted to learning together and how part of that meant they were devoted to corporate worship. Folks, doing life together is the same principle. You cannot do life together from a distance. You can't. Oh, but preacher, I can text or I can call. I can. There's just something about being there and being the shoulder to cry on or having a shoulder to cry on. There's just something about being there for each other. That's the... the Emphasis, that is the picture we get when we see koinonia. This close, interconnected, tight-knit relationship with one another. Folks, God's plan for us was to do life together. I want you to just let your mind wander for a minute. Think about what that ought to look like. It means we ought to share the joys that come along with life. When you have that new loved one that is born or you have a a new job promotion or you have whatever, there are a million and one things that bring us joy in life. Guess what koinonia means? You share those with the body of believers. Not to rub it in their face, not to go, look what I got and you didn't. Go, no, this is a blessing for all of us. And we share our joys together. What's the flip side of that coin? 
Koinonia also means we share our burdens together. I know that's going to come as a shock to some of you, but I can be extremely hard-headed. I know. I get it. I mean, you're just shocked. My wife's not in here to amen, but that's probably a good thing. I can be extremely hard-headed and stubborn. And one of those ways is I'm very guarded with what I let you see. If there's a hurt in my life or a burden in my life or a struggle in my life, I'm very guarded with who I let have access to that. And it's something that the Lord is really working on me on. Because Cornania, the fellowship, the pattern that he set for us from the beginning is that the church, the body of believers, ought to be there for me to share my burdens with, for all of us to share freely with. Why? So we can just air our dirty laundry? No, why? Because if we're really honest, we'll say, there's times where life gets too much for me. Life gets too heavy for me to do it by myself. And this is, we're going to talk about this some tonight. One of the most misquoted, taken out of context verses in the Bible. I always hear people say this. Oh, God will never put more on you than you can handle. Negative. That is not what it says. It says, I will never be tempted beyond what I can handle. But I will absolutely face more than I can handle on my own. That is why Scripture tells me that we are to bear one another's burdens and therefore fulfill the royal law. Cornelia says, I don't just share my joys, I share my burdens as well. And we're going to carry them together. We also come together and in Koinonia we share wisdom and accountability. I'm so grateful that there are people wiser than me and smarter than me in the congregations that God has let me be a part of. Because if not, we'd be in a world of hurt. People that I can go to and I know that they've been where I am. And I can look at them and go, what did you learn? How did you handle this? What do I need to be doing now? In Koinonia, there's wisdom, there's accountability to be found in our shared experiences. And it all falls under this idea of doing life together. I'm just thinking out loud here, but I wonder how many times people that left the church left so because they didn't experience a whole lot of koinonia. They felt alone even in a crowded room. They felt unseen even though they passed by a hundred people that morning. Folks, that's not doing life together. The pattern that God set was a group that was devoted to doing life together. Whether it was the best of the best or the worst of the worst, they were going to be there for each other. That's the pattern. We go on and we see some more. We see that they were devoted to remembering together. You go, wait, wait, wait. I don't know what translation you're reading out of, preacher, but I don't see that in mine. Well, look, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to what? The breaking of bread. Now, when we read about this breaking of bread, what image does it bring to your mind? It's supposed to take us back to that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples as they gathered around the table and Jesus broke bread and was passing it out and sharing it with them. That's the imagery that it's supposed to bring to our mind. But do you remember the instructions that Jesus gave them at that last supper? He told them, said, this, this is my body which is going to be broken for you. This is my blood which is going to be poured out for you. But then he goes on and what does he say? As often as you do this. Now, what does that tell us? That wasn't a worn off thing, was it? That was the only time they were all going to be gathered around the table with Jesus like that. But he says, as often as you eat this meal, as often as you do this, remember me. Now, folks, I want you to understand something. 
I don't care if it's because we got those little stale crackers and juice up here on the table or if you're out by yourself or whatever. The commitment was not to eat the meal. The commitment was to remember. And this early group, this early body of believers, the church, they devoted themselves to remembering together. They devoted themselves to remembering all that had taken place together. Why? Because in that moment, the special thing about that meal was there was a time when they just hit the pause button on life and said, I don't care what's happening outside. I don't care what's going on. We're just going to pause. And we're just going to remember Jesus. Now again, it wasn't about the meal. You can do that anywhere. We have different prayer groups and things that go on. I hope that you are devoted to remembering together in those. We have Sunday school classrooms, and I hope that you're devoted to remembering together in those. It's not the meal. It's the remembering. And the church said, you know what? Even right here from the very beginning, we don't know what the future looks like. We do. We've read the book. The future was kind of harsh for them, wasn't it? They're scattered. They've had to leave their homelands because they stuck to their faith. But even in the middle of all that, they'd hit the pause button. And they would just remember who Jesus is and what he had done for them. They remembered the love and the forgiveness that they had experienced at the hands of the Savior. They remembered the sacrifice that Jesus made up on the cross so that they could even have access to the Father at all. They'd remember the promised gift of the Holy Spirit and how now, as they have been scattered to the winds, that promised gift, the Holy Spirit, empowers them to stand boldly and preach and teach in His name. As they would pause and they would remember all that Jesus had done and all that He was, not only did it bring them together even tighter, but it propelled them forward to do the ministry that God had set aside for the church to do. Again, we go back to the list of why people might have left. And I wonder if they saw that same kind of devotion to remembering. Even when it came to taking the Lord's Supper, I wonder if it was something that People saw the purpose in it, or if it was just something we do because it was the first Sunday of the quarter. Was it just some stale crackers and some juice, or were we remembering? The pattern that was set for us was that we devote ourselves to remembering our Savior and what He did for us. And the list closes out. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we see that the early church devoted themselves to praying together. I know what you're thinking. Preacher, isn't that one kind of a no-brainer? I mean, here we are. We are at church. Prayer kind of goes with it. I mean, we're really good at knowing when to pray, how to pray, what to say when we have these public prayers. I've told some of you this story before, and Kev, if you're watching, I'm sorry, I'm about to tell on you. My brother, when we were in youth group, he was uh, almost three years younger than me. And so I was junior, senior, Kev was in junior high. But uh, the youth minister that we had at the time thought it would be a really good idea to get some of the youth boys to help take the offering. I didn't think it's a bad idea then. I still don't think it's a bad idea now. But here was the thing. You had three teenage boys up here. One of them had to pray. My brother figured out a system. He had three prayers scripted. And so if he was one of them taking the offering, I would look at him and go, what is it tonight? And he goes, I think tonight's an A night. And then some nights would be B, and some nights would be C, and it would just, but he had three prayers scripted. And sadly, for a lot of us, that is what we make of prayer, even here inside of a body of believers. 
We make it into a God is great, God is good type prayer. Or now I lay me down to sleep. We've made prayer into something that is just rote and routine and just something we do from memory. When really prayer is us communing with our Heavenly Father, talking to the God of the universe, communicating with Him and letting Him speak to us. What we see in the early church is they were devoted to praying. Not like we pray a lot of times. They really prayed. As I read through some of the prayers here in the book of Acts, here's some things that I see. They prayed with desperation. They prayed like their lives depended on them because often they did. They poured out their hearts to God as if he was the only one who could do anything about it because he was. And I wonder when was the last time we prayed with that kind of desperation. You keep reading through the prayers and you see that they prayed with a power that shook buildings. Literally, physically shook buildings. You flip over just a couple chapters in Acts chapter 4, the believers are all together and they're praying. And they're praying that God would empower them to speak boldly, even in the face of persecution. It says the place where they were shook. Oh, preacher, that's just one time. Nope. Paul and Silas are in prison, chained together. The church is praying for them. And what happens? The building is shook. The chains fall off. Folks, they pray with a power that we are afraid of. They prayed with a power that was put in there by the Holy Spirit. And we are afraid of it. You know, I don't know if that's true, preacher. When was the last time you prayed something powerful? Or when was the last time that you didn't? Because you're afraid God just might answer it. They prayed with the desperation. They prayed with power. And here is maybe the biggest thing that sets them apart from us. They prayed expectingly. There was none of this, okay, I'm going to pray. Maybe, maybe he'll answer me. Maybe he won't. No. They prayed, they approached the throne of God with confidence, expecting him to answer. Why? Because they were approaching him, asking for his will to be done. They were wanting to line themselves up with him. And when that's the case, guess what? God is more than happy to answer your prayer. As we read through the book of Acts, we see this is how they prayed. And they devoted themselves to this kind of prayer. Not just individually, but together. Whenever they would get together, whenever the body would assemble, it was marked by this type of desperate, powerful prayer as they expected God to move in their midst. And I read that, and I go, oh Lord, when was the last time that marked us? When was the last time That is how we operated. But that was the the plan. That was the model for the church from the very beginning. That it would be devoted to praying together. As we look at Acts chapter 2 here, and we get our first glimpses of the early church. We see that they truly were a body in every sense of the word. Yes, they'd come from different parts and different places, different experiences, but they came together to form a unit, one group that was devoted to God and each other. And here's the thing. God used that recipe to change the world. When there became a group that became one body that was devoted to him and to each other, God says, that's the plan. That's what I'm going to use. Folks, here's the thing. The plan has not changed. He wants to do that very same thing through the church today. 
as we devote ourselves to him and to each other, God says, you have not yet scratched the surface of what you can do or who you can be. That's the plan. So this morning, as we get ready to go into this time of response, first I want to ask you this. We said that the church is a body of believers. Has there come a point where you unapologetically said, Jesus is my Savior, He is my Lord, and He is my hope for eternity? If not, I don't care how long your name has been on the church roll. I don't care how often you have sat in a pew and can sing all the songs. If there's not been that point, you're not part of the church. But that can change today. As I look around the room, though, I know that many of us can go back to a point in time where we settled that. Where, yes, I remember when I gave Jesus my life and told him he can do with it whatever he wants. So for those of us who have that as our testimony, here's my question for you. Are you devoted to the same things that the early church was? Are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? Are you devoted to the fellowship? Are you devoted to the breaking of bread and to prayer? If not, today's a really good day to start. God has a plan for the church. We are the plan. There is no plan B. We'll talk some more about that next week. We are the plan that he has set in motion to reach the world. But it's going to take us following the model. Let's pray. Father God, this morning, I thank you that we've been able to gather here, Lord, that we've been able to open your word, and Lord, uh, more than that, that Lord, your word has been able to speak to us. God, I pray as we look at what the church is or what it's supposed to be, God, I pray that you challenge us. Lord, we know it starts right here with this, this body of believers. And God, the devotion that they showed to you and to each other. Lord, I pray that as we go into this time of response, Lord, and you're speaking to our hearts, that God, if there's anything in us where we need to get something right, or Lord, we need to get our priorities right, or, or, or whatever it might be, that God, today we show that same kind of devotion. Lord, we know that you set all of this in motion because, Lord, this was your plan to reach the world. God, we want to be an active part of that. So, God, do whatever you've got to do in us right now. Lord, we love you and we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
If he is your living hope, that means you are a part of this body of believers. You are a part of the church. And that is a high calling and a privilege. Because like I said, this is the plan that God has put together to reach the world around us. And so my prayer is we go through the rest of this study as we reflect on this morning of what it means to be the church. And we would show the same devotion that they did. And then it would manifest itself in all that we do. And that God would use us to reach the world around us. And that we would be able to say that more people are going to go to heaven and less people are going to go to hell because of what we, the church, have done. Well, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, don't forget, we're going to take just a short break when we're done here. And then we'll meet back in here for our, our regular business meeting. And then uh, tonight we'll be here at 5 o'clock. So anyway, um, David Kelly, will you pray for us this morning?